2021 was a weird year in tech. Nothing's really changed, at least for the better. The budget PC community kind of relies on people tossing their old stuff out to make room for the hot new thing, and the message from the tech elites is that, nah, we're good. I know it's not that long since I was bragging about my gaming and editing PC, but I got back into PCs through budget builds, and they still have a place in my heart. It kind of kills me a little to see the options for cheaper components dwindling through the scalper pandemic, so I thought I'd see if I could offer any advice to those looking to get started in what most consider to be a bad time. While 2021 might not have been great for GPUs, it's an amazing market for CPUs. Budget builders can put together systems with hyper-threaded quad cores pretty easily these days, thanks to Socket 1155 Xeons, like the E3 1240v1 or first gen Ryzen's. The Xeon is a pretty old server CPU, and as old servers get retired and replaced, these chips flood the market periodically, and for very low prices. For this year's £150 build, I picked up the Sandy Bridge E3 1240 for just £25, though Ivy Bridge V2 chips, even higher clocked models, are available for as little as £40. Supporting motherboards for these chips don't need to be anything fancy either, so it's possible to save money and pick up a B, Q or H board instead of a Z series. If you were interested in something more modern, maybe something with a little more room for overclocking and upgrading, you could consider first gen Ryzen. Although arguably the early Zen architecture hasn't aged all that well, the quad core R5 1400 comes in a fair bit faster than the Xeons, and paired with a cheap B450 can give at least some overclocking flexibility, as well as an upgrade path as far as 3000 series. Now, prices on the 1400 are pretty volatile, and availability isn't as good as the Xeons, so although ideally you'd be paying close to the £67 I paid for a 1500X earlier in the year, you might find they're closer to £90 these days. By this point, you could get yourself something even more powerful. The used price on the Ryzen 3 3100 is back down to less than the SRP again, meaning £90 can get you a quad-core 8-thread Zen 2 CPU that can perform on par with a Kaby Lake i7 in games. I'd suggest the 3300X as a viable alternative, but as Random Gaming in HD pointed out recently, that better binned single CCX quad-core kind of vanished off the face of the earth not long after release. As a result, I think you're more likely to get a good deal on the 3500X or 3600 than you are on a 3300X. If overclocking isn't your thing, and no judgement from me, a good alternative to the Ryzen's is the 10 series from Intel. Although I haven't built one myself, I've seen from other people's videos that the i3-10100 and i5-10400 can equal or beat their respective 4 and 6 core Ryzen counterparts in games. Choosing the F versions of the chips means skipping the integrated graphics, but saving a few quid in the process, meaning the i3 can be had for under £80 and the i5 for £120. What you save on the CPUs, however, you tend to have to pay for the motherboards. Multiplier-locked A320 boards can be had for as little as £25, and the aforementioned B450 can cost only slightly higher than that, whereas Intel B460 and B560 boards seem to start at closer to £60. Both platforms are essentially dead now, so uh, pick the one you can get for the best price, or which company you've sworn fealty to, or whose brand colour you prefer. Whatever, you should be happy either way. Keeping your chosen CPU cool isn't necessarily a huge additional expense, if you're picking up a used Ryzen, there's a chance your vendor will include the original Wraith cooler. In my experience, even the basic Wraith Stealth is sufficient to cool a quad-core or six-core, at least enough to run at stock speeds. If you're not fortunate enough to get one for free, they tend to sell for £10 or less on the used market. Intel's stock coolers aren't as well regarded by most, but could do the job if they can be found cheap enough. I'd say £5 or less is a fair price. 
If you feel like stepping up a little, basic tower coolers from Arctic and Be Quiet are the cheapest options I can recommend from experience, coming in at under £20 and are a good upgrade from the Intel, though probably an unnecessary one from the Raid Stealth, in my opinion. A small extra expenditure can get you the very well regarded Vtru V5 for better cooling and ARGB, which of course adds 15% more FPS and 3 inches to your dick. I made a video earlier in the year comparing 8GB and 16GB of RAM in a low spec PC, and concluded that for overall smoothness of gameplay, 16 gigs is definitely worthwhile. On the other hand, and hear me out, an acceptable alternative is 8GB of RAM and assigning your Windows page file to an SSD. I got some pushback on this as SSDs have a finite lifespan and using them for paging is potentially going to hasten their demise. But well, it's a decision you have to make for yourself. Whichever option you choose, it's worth ensuring you get two sticks of memory so that your RAM operates in dual channel which can have a massive impact on your minimum frame rates. I don't have any special tips on buying DDR4 RAM except, uh, well, look for deals online and don't forget to check clearance and open box returns in places like Amazon Warehouse. For DDR3 to go with the Xeons, check eBay and use your usual due diligence with seller feedback and make sure you're not buying AMD exclusive RAM. Also while Xeons support ECC RAM and ECC RAM can be very cheap, do be sure to check your motherboard's manual online to be 100% positive that it's supported. If you've ever used a system or console with a solid state drive as its primary storage, you'll know it's pretty hard to go back to conventional hard disk drives afterwards. The best value option for storage, according to many system builders, is to have a relatively small SSD, say 120 to 250 gigabytes, to store the operating system and maybe one or two of your most played games, and a mass storage hard drive for games and downloads. This combo will benefit general system operations somewhat, but the real reason to choose this setup is, of course, price per gigabyte. I'd expect a 120 gig SSD and 1 terabyte hard drive combo to cost no more than £50, compared to at least £70 for a 1 terabyte SATA SSD. Now that I think about it, that price difference actually doesn't seem all that bad, and if you think 1TB will be sufficient, this might be a good time to consider going for an all-flash storage option. SSD pricing tends to go up quite sharply over the 1TB mark, so if you're looking for a good value 2TB option, you'll probably be best sticking to the SSD-HDD combo. My position on power supplies has evolved this year. I've previously been guilty of putting too much trust in the 80 plus certification, and as such, I've bought some seriously dodgy shit for my PCs. I'm officially retracting that recommendation. I don't care if it's 80 plus bronze or gold, if I don't trust the brand, it's not going in. My best personal PSU experience so far has been with EVGA. My 750GQ has been going strong in my personal PC for 5 years, and so far I've been happy to trust their lower priced PSUs based on recommendations from others. There are other known reliable brands that make economical PSUs, like Thermaltake, Seasonic and Antec, that cost in the £30 to £50 range. Compared to Game Max, Aero Cool and others, they might not look like great value, but you'll be happy with the investment in the long run. It's hard to recommend specific cases in a video that's going out internationally. The best budget cases I've built in this year have been a Techware Forge M and an Antec NX410. I would cautiously recommend either of these £50 cases to my UK audience, but they might not be available in your country or might have been rebranded. Don't make the same mistake I did when budgeting for a case and fans though. I ended up stripping out the NX10 supplied fans, which were actually one of the main reasons I bought the case, because they didn't connect to the motherboard. Fan speed and LED colour were controlled by a remote. This meant I ended up spending an additional £30 on a triple pack of RGB fans and a hub. If I'd known in advance that the supplied fans were shit, I might have looked for a more premium case like a Lian Lee or Fantex with proper PWM fans included, and saving myself from looking like a bit of a pillock. 
With all that said, you have a good idea of exactly what kind of components you should be looking at for a good value gaming PC going into 2022. Of course, you might have noticed a graphics card shaped hole in the spec. I made a whole separate video about that particular wrinkle, linked in the description, but to summarise it, my GPU recommendations right now stop at around the £200 mark. In my opinion, a quad-core Ryzen 3 3100 or i3 10100F with 16 gigs of RAM should be enough to power all or most of the cards I recommend in that video, and stepping up to a Ryzen 5 3600 or i5 10400F will give you room to grow into something a little more powerful in the future. This means you could have a modern, effective gaming PC for about five to six hundred pounds. If you're on a tighter budget, the older Intel and Ryzen quad cores should still be able to extract a lot of performance from something like an R9 290 or GTX 970, making for a pretty capable gaming machine in the ballpark of three to four hundred pounds. So that's the end of this particular series on surviving the scalper pandemic. Hope it's been useful for you. That is, if your desire to get into PC gaming hasn't been completely crushed in the last 12 months. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.